Hello all, it's a delight to meet you today and I'm really looking forward to talking to you about the, your latest release. Um, it's been such an enjoyable read, a real page turner, you really bring the past and story to life. To those of you listening, Anne is a Sunday Times best-selling author, internationally published, sold over half a million copies and this is just released from HarperCollins as a book, as an e-book, an audio book, and I highly recommend it. So, Anne, tell us, what is the Royal Game all about? It's about the Paston family, who were a family on the rise. Over a hundred years, they um, improved from being bondsmen to being gentry. Um, and it's a family, it's a story of survival. There was so much that could have stopped this. Families in this middle area of, of society could quite easily fall as, as quickly as they could rise. There were disputes within the family. There were disputes uh, outside. The great magnates in uh, Norfolk and Suffolk were intent on uh, using their armies to snatch whatever land they could get from the Pastons. And yet they managed to um, overset the whole of it and remain uh, an important family. So that by the time of the first Tudor, uh, they were recognised and invited to court. The other important thing is that being a very resilient family, the women come through very strongly. Um, and we get an impression of what the Paston women were doing within the family and uh, the role they played in, in achieving this great success during the, uh, the 15th century. I couldn't resist them. <laughs> so as you say, it's quite a diverse, all-encompassing story that really brings this period to life. Um, and you mentioned the Paston women. It's really interesting because you really do focus in on three, Margaret Paston, Elizabeth Paston, and then Anne Hoyt as well. The Elizabeth and Anne would tend to be considered usually as more minor characters in the Paston family. So why did you choose to focus in on them and how did you bring them to life? I chose them because Agnes and Margaret are typical Pastons in many ways. Uh, they were chosen as brides for the Pastons because they were heiresses in their own right. And they were very dominant women. Uh, with a, a mind to what they should do as a past and wife. In a novel, I think there needs to be variety to show that uh, not all pastons, not all pastoral women fit into this category. And this is Elizabeth and Anne. Elizabeth, of course, was um, Agnes's only daughter. Um, and with her, we see the problem of young women achieving suitable marriages and what can happen uh, when a suitable husband does not appear. And Elizabeth suffered greatly. Agnes could not find a suitable husband for her. She found fault with most of them. Usually it was money uh, and status and uh, claims on their property outside the, what would be the Paston family. And so she refused them all. And her tolerance and patience with Elizabeth grew steadily stronger. Uh, she beat her daughter, she kept her in confinement, and in the end she boarded her out to Lady de la Pole in London, hoping that uh, she would get her from under her feet. And she made it clear in her letters that she, uh, she didn't want to go on living with Elizabeth. This is a very different view of the Pastons, and it also gives us a different view of Agnes, uh, who is not a, um, a, a, what we would call a, a compassionate mother during this time. Um, Fortunately for Elizabeth, she discovers a, a husband in London and, and achieves some happiness with her own household round her. Now Anne Holt is quite different. She wasn't a pastor, but would very much like to have become one. If she could pin John II down to um, uh, agreeing with what he said, with what he did, um, he wooed her, uh, he liked her company, he liked even more, I think, the fact that she was first cousin to the Queen, Elizabeth Woodville. And this would have been an incredibly fortunate combination of, of uh, connections for John. Um, and so it seems that they um, took vows, private ones, between the two of them that they would wed. Um, but could she make him then go further than that and 
announced to, to the world and to his mother and to his family that in fact they were man and wife. Uh, again, it shows a different side to the Pastons and particularly to, to Sir John, John II, um, as he was then, particularly uh, of the, the younger sons. Uh, and I thought they deserved a, a role in the book. Mm. So it's really fascinating. You're really bringing in what could have been minor characters to show how they can show us a major new perspective into the family, both the inner workings of the characters of the big figures like Margaret and Agnes, but then also um, the, the how, how people interact with the male figures like John Paston, but through the eyes of and these different perspectives. So that's a really interesting take on the story. How did you find out about the Pastons in the first place and what motivated you to write about them? They were a name that kept cropping up, and particularly when I was writing about the Wars of the Roses. Uh, and Cecil and Neville. And of course they uh, make comments about what's going on at court, um, what's happening in their own Norfolk situation. And so every now and then I found a quotation from uh, one of the Pastons. And I'd, I'd known about them anyway and about their letter writing, but recently I thought I looked more closely at this family uh, and see what, uh, what I think to them. In the past I've always written about the court and the aristocracy and the royalty because I like writing about uh, relationships, yes, but also medieval politics. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to abandon that class of people for uh, the Pastons. But after reading about them and seeing what the women were doing, I was convinced that here was a book that needed writing uh, because they have so much to offer. And we tend not to know very much about this rank of people. And here in the letters, uh, we get uh, ideas, we get uh, ambitions, uh, we get um, the whole range of what the, this class of people were probably doing. And so I decided, yes, I would change from the aristocracy and write about the customs instead. That's great. You're on silent in the voices of the women, but you're also on silence in the voices of this new class of people as well, which is, which is great. Um, I'm just picking up on something you said there that very little is known about the Pastons more generally in, in the great public domain. Um, that's certainly true. There's been a lot of academic study and local history study, but more generally, the other big historical novel that springs to mind would be Helen Castor's Blood and Roses. Um, I'm just wondering, did that novel give you any inspiration? And is your novel a response to that? Or do you offer something different? Is there something different about your writing? Um, let me think about that one. Um, I was surprised that so little had been written um, fictionally about the Pastons. And so I, I like to think that medieval women need to be given the opportunity to speak out. They are silent for the most part, quite simply because history on the whole is written by men, for men, about men. And so the women tend to be two-dimensional um, and skeletons without flesh and without any, any real thoughts. And why should they spend their time doing very little at home, sitting in a solar, stitching, not having an opinion? I'm quite sure that they, they did. Now, to access that sort of idea about women, it has to be written as um, a novel, historical fiction because the factual material isn't there. Uh, and so I have to be prepared to um, not change what's there, but to develop it uh, and write about what we know, but to open it out to what these women were actually doing and probably would be saying. Uh, and that's what made me think that why hasn't anyone done this before? And yet, as you say, it's not been a popular subject. So I decided I would try. I wasn't convinced when I started writing that it would work, but as soon as I began, I realized it would because there is so much there to, um, to interest and to intrigue and that's it, the royal game appeared.
Excellent. Yes, as you say, the, um, the Paston letters from the 15th century, there were about a thousand letters. 104 are written by Margaret Paston, but actually there's very few written by the other Paston women. There's, there's you know, there's very, uh, there's a lot written about them by the male Pastons, but the ones that have survived, you know, there's about 30 or so for Agnes, and it, there's, there's barely, so for some of the Paston women, no letters at all. Um, and yet, one of the women is the best known Paston because she's the author of the earliest recorded Valentine letter, and that's Marjorie Bruce Paston. Um, she marries into the Paston, marries John III. So we might be forgiven for thinking, oh, these letters are all full of romance and sex and intrigue, but it's not really that kind of information you get from the letters. Sure, it's not. It's more about land disputes and stuff. So how do you, as a historical fiction writer, go about using your historical source, the letters, but manage to get characters out of them? Um, I used the litigation and the disputes, but with, a, with a, a light hand. I think it has to be so because it is a novel and it has to have a page turning quality. And as you say, so much that within the letters is about dispute over um, one manner or, or the other, either Hellesden or Drayton or Cotton or Gresham or whichever. And so it has to be very selective. Um, what I used. And when it's used, it has to be within the story of the women themselves to highlight what they think, how they react, um, how they feel about what's going on in the family and how it will affect their relationships with others within the family. So that it's not bolted on, but is um, interwoven with, the, with what the, the past and women are doing. I think it's the same with all historical fiction that includes major events. It's so easy to, um, to uh, dwell on the major event and not on what your character is actually uh, being involved in. And that's the interesting thing in a novel, or I think so anyway. Um, and so it really was a case of being selective choosing some of the disputes and developing them. Um, some of them I more or less omitted because of time constraints and my editor saying there is a word limit on this book and otherwise because as I say it, 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 the pace must not flag and to go too much into too much detail it does drag the pace down and it makes people weary of it and they want to get back to what the women are doing and thinking. So basically it has to be woven in and to think yes what would Margaret think about the Gresham situation? Um, uh, does it cause disputes in the family? Yes, it does between her and her husband, between her and her sons, between her husband and sons. And they're the things that are so interesting, I think. So it's really like you're inhabiting that character and you're, you're breathing and imagining what it's like to be that character. And that's certainly what comes across when reading the novel. You, you feel you're really getting to know these characters, which is great. Um, as you mentioned, there are disputes, Gresham, Helsden, um, Caster, there's lots of land disputes, there's lots of disputes with their neighbours over numerous things, um, and certainly the, this is during the period of the Wars of the Roses. And yet, um, while there's tensions between the Yorkists and Lancastrians um, interrupt the past and schemes for advancements, um, there's, as you say, there's a need not to focus too much on context, too much on a historical account. So how do you deal with the sense of lawlessness in the novel? Do you give that sense of Yorkists versus Lancastrians? You know, if you're coming to this without knowledge of Wars of the Roses, do you need to have that knowledge? What do you do about that whole sense of lawlessness that we find in, in the past and period? Yes, I agree. It's, it's not easy. Some of the lawlessness I developed and um, described it in Norwich, particularly the, the, the street brawls uh, in which Margaret and Agnes were involved uh, and when John himself was attacked in, in the environs of, of the cathedral. That sort of lawlessness comes very nicely within, the, um, within the, the family and the story. The Wars of the Roses, yes it has to be explained to an extent, but again 
very much as it affects the family, not again, again uh, here is what is happening in the Wars of the Roses. Um, I, I think that is too much. But what um, readers need to know is the, uh, the need of the Pastons for a patron. And this is desperate for them because the Duke of Norfolk and the Duke of Suffolk are so powerful that there's no chance for the Pastons to fight back against them uh, and keep a hold of, of their lands. And so they have to look uh, for help elsewhere. They look to the church, uh, they uh, look to uh, um, the Earl of Oxford eventually, and of course it's the Earl of Oxford who takes them into actual warfare, uh, uh, into battle uh, at Barnet. And of course there, because they're on the losing side, uh, they end up as um, traitors uh, and with the, the possibility of losing their land. So it has to be explained to that extent to, to bring uh, the pastant into what is happening uh, throughout England. But in fact, there were so few battles in Norfolk and, and the, the local area that it, it doesn't um, impinge on them too much. So again, with a light hand so that uh, it, it's understandable but it's not uh, overwhelmed by national events. Mm -hmm. Excellent insight and of course one of the difficulties with the Paston story for anybody approaching it um, whether it's the first time you're encountering it or it's the 20th year of encountering it is that it's such a big story and uh, there's so many people involved um, you've got this big large letter corpus to d dig into. Um, how do you sort out a beginning and a middle and an end for a novel? Because you kind of need that narrative arc and structure in a novel. So how do you stop it from being a whole series of mini stories and how did you thread it into one coherent shape of a narrative? I decided the best place to start it was uh, on the death of uh, Justice William uh, and so it brings a lot of the main characters in there um, and it also brings the first dispute over the will where Agnes claims that uh, on his deathbed Justice William changed his mind so immediately you get a conflict and you get the main people there and of course the conflict continues to the end of the book and to the end of uh, the whole story with uh, uh, Agnes's son William thinking that he has been disinherited uh, and uh, wanting to, to get uh, uh, land back that ought to have been his. So it seemed to uh, start pretty well there. After that, um, it's chronological. It fell very easily into a, a, a sort of seamless um, uh, trend, but changing voices so that when um, Elizabeth becomes the main voice, it, it fits in there and Anne Hout uh, very much towards the middle and end of the book uh, when she becomes a, a figure on the scene. Where to end it? Um, I decided to leave it on a cliffhanger with uh, suddenly the Duke of Norfolk's forces arriving at um, uh, Caister Castle uh, and claiming that uh, the whole land was his and that the, uh, um, the will, the Pastor will, uh, was uh, of no value and it seemed to, to be good there to end it on that point leaving it unclear what would happen next. Mm -hmm. um, yes moving through all the letters is difficult some of them um, I had to um, abandon because they as I said they're very much into dispute over litigation uh, and so they had to be pushed on one side but I found that the, um, the chronology of it worked quite well once I knew which Paston women I was going to write about. Excellent. Um, I'm just reflecting on my own experiences of the letters. One of the most frustrating things to a critic of the letters is that we often don't have the letter that the letter is responding to or the response to the letter. So you get things said in them like, um, the thing that you sent me, and we don't know what that thing was or you know that sort of sense that um, these matters that we're now dealing with we don't really know what they are. Um, what would you say is the most frustrating element for a historical novelist when when writing? What, 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 what makes you go eh. um, I think you've, you've nailed it beautifully there when there are so many um, uh, elements that are unsure 
and when I can't find anything nationally that I can link it to or even particularly locally. Sometimes uh, it may be uh, the state of trade in uh, Norwich um, and when Margaret was anxious about whether she should sell her wood then or later because the, uh, it wasn't of great value then and she'd get more money for it and yet uh, uh, her son was, was demanding money to, to be spent on things at court. Um, sometimes it's possible to, to guess, if you like, a bit of uh, uh, imagination there, uh, but sometimes it's not. And in that case, I have to say that I omitted it and just you know, pushed it on one side and went on to something that was definite. Uh, because I think when it is so uncertain, it doesn't push the plot on anyway. And if you're not careful, you end up falling into rabbit holes uh, and they can't get out of them. Indeed, indeed. And what about the language? Because obviously these letters are written in the 15th century and English language has changed so much. Um, do you get a flavour of uh, the way in which they sound in the letters? Um, do you just translate it? How do you translate it into modern English? Um, I try and write formally um, on the whole because that's how they, they wrote the letters. And yet there are elements of closeness and of intimacy and um, where the formality falls away. I haven't used much verbatim from the letters, except for starts and ends of the letters, which are usually religious, and it gives an idea of how important it was to Margaret uh, that she wished her son well and uh, in, in God's good grace and such. And I love some of them, you know, written in haste, and I expect a reply in haste. You can just imagine her uh, um, uh, uh, not sure that... Um, either husband or son would reply any time soon for her uh, and uh, and yet she she writes this, some lovely pieces of work there. Um, otherwise uh, very much in uh, of course modern English, um, no anachronisms of course um, and very plainly written in that sense uh, so that it, it's not middle English but neither is it quirky or anything like that and I hope it comes over um, in a fairly straightforward way, so the reading of it is easy. If readers then like what they read, it might uh, persuade them to go back and look at the letters and see how they're, it's written in the letters. I mean, some of it is lovely. I love the way that however angry Margaret might be at one of her family, if there's a necessity, she tacks on to the end some shopping she would like from London, this wonderful multitasking of a medieval housewife. Uh, and that sort of thing I certainly did pick up. So, you know, the piece of sugar and the uh, cloth to make uh, hats for the boys and, and such, such like. It's a lovely touch and things like that, of course, I used. Brilliant. Can I invite you now to give us a, a, a short reading from your novel, just to give us a flavour of this wonderful way in which you bring these characters to life for us? Yes, I, I will. And this is um, an example of um, creative li license, if you like, um, of uh, using what we have, but developing it to make a dramatic and exciting scene, as I'm sure it would have been. And this is to do with Gresham, which was uh, very dear to Margaret. It was her jointure. And yet the, uh, the dastardly Lord Mullanes had taken it from them. He had no right to, but he claimed that he could. And he'd taken over the, uh, the manor and the, the castle. And um, John was in London trying to um, get the land back legally. But Margaret was not satisfied. Typical Margaret this. And so she rented a house in the village and took herself there to, to have a past and presence, if you like. Um, and just to... Um, Look, look at what was happening and make sure that the Mullane's um, uh, um, soldiers and uh, steward and such knew that she was there. And so this is what I think would have happened. This is Tuesday the 28th of January 1449. Mistress, mistress, there was a hammering at my chamber door enough to raise the dead. It was early before we had even broken our fast when I was still clasping my keys at my waist, much in the manner of Mistress Agnes. 
which made me smile with grim appreciation. I was becoming a matriarch in my own household. We had yet to say our household prayers. I could hear Eliza moving around in her chamber next to mine. I could see no need for such urgency, unless the well was frozen or the ale had turned sour overnight. One moment, I said. Fastening a final pin to my coif, I cast a glance around. All was as it should be in the chamber of a careful tenant. I took a deep breath, prepared to face the day. The knocking on my door came again. Now, mistress, now, I swear it's more than urgent. My steward was most peremptory. I opened the door intending to upbraid him for his strident tones, but he grabbed my arm in his distress, pulling me to follow. Seeing the wild emotion writ large on his face, I made no complaint. Come and see, mistress, what do we do? He urged me into another of the upper rooms where my children slept, and all was awry with the detritus of the young. I thrust open the window and leaned out to take in the full scene below. There, congregating before my door, was a force of men in Mullane's livery. The complicated melee of black and white stripes and gold chevron against red and green was more than clear. Beneath the livery, I could see that they were wearing every sort of warlike protection, jacks and brigadines, all topped with salads that gleamed in the late rising sun. So many men that I could not count them. Where had they all come from? They must have gathered under the protection of darkness to achieve the element of surprise. All armed to the teeth. I withdrew inside again. They surround the house, mistress, on all sides, my steward announced the appalling news releasing me. I tried to marshal my thoughts. My steward was looking at me for direction. We had a mere 12 men in our household to protect us. We could not possibly hold this force at bay. I was left with little choice, flee in ignominy, or be taken captive in my garden, or sit tight, refuse to open the doors, and force Mullanes to show his hand. Well, mistress, he almost hopped with anxiety. A paston did not flee. I walked onto the upper landing and raised my voice so that all could hear. Make sure all the doors are locked. Arm every man. Keep clear of the windows in case they decide to use arrows against us. Then we wait to hear the demands from our neighbour. How I wished that John were here. What did I know about repelling what might become a siege? But John could not save me, nor were any friends near enough. Eliza, I called, and there she was beside me, her eyes wide with horror, but her voice strong. Do what you must, she said. Leave the children to my care. I squeezed her hand in gratitude as she set herself to dress and feed them. Meanwhile, there was a stir in the force gathering below. They were bringing forward a hefty tree trunk that left nothing to my imagination. They were going to batter down my door. The captain looked up, his attention drawn by my leaning from the window once again. He grinned. You see the force drawn up against you, mistress? Do you and yours come out, or do we come in and drive you out? The house is mine, and I will stay here. I slammed the window shut so that, so that I could not hear his response. Would I order my men to attack? It would do no good. It would only bring down certain death on them. It would be like casting a handful of pebbles to prevent a landslide. And then a hammering on, of wood on plaster wall of my parlour began. And I think that's probably a flavour of what might have happened at Gresham. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so much, Anne. That's just, uh, that's just, if that doesn't encourage people to want to engage with the novel, I don't know what will. Um, you did give us that little hint, that little sense that the novel ends on a cliffhanger. I've heard rumours that there's going to be a sequel. Can you give us any insight into that? Yes, indeed. It's already written, in fact. It's with my editor at the moment, so I'm waiting to hear what he thinks. Um, it's a, a, a sequel that ties off some loose ends, like Case to Castle, and it, it opens up some uh, new elements of the story. It's got more um, 
emotion, perhaps in some ways, uh, the love of uh, Marjorie Brews uh, and John III, um, the sadness for Elizabeth, who loses one husband in the battle at St Albans, but then finds another, uh, and so um, achieves a second dose of happiness, if you like. Um, the daughter, the daughter who ran off with the bailiff and caused such scandal in the Paston family, that of course has to be dealt with. And it, it, uh, it creates a, a marvellous whole with Margaret living more or less throughout the whole uh, until um, in the, uh, she doesn't live quite to the end. And the story in the final scene is taken up by Marjorie Brews, who I thought it was a fitting place for her just to express a, an idea about Margaret. And so there is a lot to look at again in the sequel, and I've enjoyed writing it. At the moment it's called Fortune's Wheel, but it probably will change its name before it, it meets the shelves. Absolutely. Well, um, again, I highly recommend people The Royal Game, Anna Brian, and thank you very much for talking to us today, Anne. Thank you very much. It's been a delight to be with you. Karen.